Hello, and welcome to another episode of For the Love of Sports. My name is Michael Brazil. This is a show where we get to talk about sports, we get to talk about business, and we get to talk about everything in between. Wherever you're listening, however you're listening, you know exactly what to do. Five-star review on Spotify, like and subscribe on YouTube, over on Apple Podcasts. Give me a five-star review and write something really nice about me and my incredible guest today. I have Tina T- Tina. Provost, Teeny, I'm sure you've had that yet game before. That's fine, Tina. too. You can say that. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> Tina Provost, she is a former Division One cheerleader at Ohio State, co-founder and CEO of Five Star Fans, and FSGA member of the board. Tina, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? It's a great day to be alive, Tina. It is it a is. great day to be alive. The weather's beautiful. Work was great. I get this great conversation right. now. What what else could I ask? So my son just stopped crying. Look at that. I told you my wife was going to go in there. Would you yes, look at that? See, he knew. Look at us. He knew we had something important to do. Look he at that. Who would have thought? Who'd have thought? Not me. Not me. <laughs> De- definitely not me. Uh, Tina, very excited to get to chat about your athletic career, your business career, everything that you've done up to this point. going to be super exciting. But the first question I have for everybody on the For the okay. Love of Sports podcast is, why do you love sports so much? Well, why do I love sports so much? I think anybody know- that knows anything about sports is going to say it's because nearly everybody loves sports because it gives them something bigger than themselves to be part of. It's this community feel, whether you've been an athlete before or you're a fan or spectator. But I think the differentiator for for everybody's answer is why you needed or desired that sense of community. Um, So I'll give a brief background and then let me know if you want me to elaborate more. But um, I started playing sports in middle school and um, once I started and I, I didn't make the basketball team, weirdly, I'm five foot and they cut me like, hmm. how weird is that? Huh? What are the chances? So it turned out I was better at cheerleading than basketball, which ended up doing me pretty well. Um, but I found the way that I grew up is um, I, I, I grew up with a parent that struggled with drug addiction and another with alcoholism. And so and I I'm one of four. And so I had a lot of responsibility as a kid. And when I was able to go play my sport, go to practice, whatever, I got to be away from that and I kind of got to be a kid. I had coaches and leadership that gave me something I didn't necessarily have at home. Um, And I was very fortunate to have friends where I got to see experiences and examples from them and their parents. Um, And that, that enhanced even more once I got to Ohio state, Um, the people that I cheered with there, um, three of them are my dearest best friends and, One's my brother and the other two are basically my sisters. So to me, that's the sense of community that I got. And and then going through Ohio State, um, the the cheer, dance and uh, mascot team at OSU, um, they only rely on endowments and donations for scholarship. And so I had an extreme obligation to continue to give back and raise and make sure those athletes were taken care of. And so while it gave me a sense of community, I got to learn a lot. These are the experiences. Gosh, I mean, pretty incredible. Now I just have this sense of obligation forever to give back however I can, whether, you know, I'm helping raise money for scholarship or we help the students get jobs or make connections. So I don't think, you know, the sense of community for me, it's changed. It goes and it's gone in phases since I was in middle school until today, but really that's, that's the core of it. So now I just, I love it. It made me who I am today. I would never be, I'm in Miami right now. I came from DC from a really sweet meeting last night, met amazing, awesome people in the sports industry. And I get to do it again tomorrow night. Never, never would be able to do this if not for my sport and the experience I had. That is incredible. Uh, that is absolutely incredible. And you love to hear it, right? And I appreciate you elaborating on that community aspect of it, especially with your background, as you said, with both of your parents, and, and then being able to take kind of sport and that that has now those people became part of your family, too, yeah. right? And that that has then allowed you, as you said, to feel like a kid when you were younger, but also now where you are in your life, and be able to then give back and say, I remember what this made me feel like. Mm-hmm. Now let's try and make this the feeling for other people and make it even better, right? You always want what yeah. um what is what's the saying? You always want your kids to have it better than you had. Yeah, right, we, I've but had then it pretty good. Spoiled and you're like, I was gonna say right? I've had it pretty good. So like, yeah. uh, you know, I'm I'm a little worried about uh, the the crying baby in the background, but um no, in sincerity, man, I think like that is such a such a unique um unique story, right? And, and the ability for you to kind of not just overcome, but be able to take advantage for lack of a better term of kind of where you came from. Yeah. You take advantage of the situation and not everybody's wired in those certain ways to operate. Um, but you nailed it. Yeah, that's right. And we're lucky. I feel all the time. So 
Yeah. And sports is fun too, because you get to see how much it gives other people that maybe weren't athletes, but they have this emotional connection to a team or a player um, because they had experiences as kids, kids maybe going with their parents to games. And those are those core memories people build around that community. So it's pretty special. I don't know. I mean, we're lucky you and I get to, this is our job. We get to do this. Not too shabby. And yeah, yeah. I mean, going to a school like Ohio state, right. That is, that's like one of the blue buds of college sports, right? Like obviously oh, yeah, yeah. football and everything that's going on there. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that, 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 that the pomp, the circumstance, that's why I love college sports, right? Like the product on the field is what it is. It's so much fun to watch, but it's also it just the, the 150,000 fans that are there that are watching the game. They're screaming yeah. their heads off, right? As you said, yeah. that they've been, they've been going to Ohio state games their whole life. They're going to keep going. Their kids are going to go. Their kids, kids are yeah. going to go. And it's like that lineage. It's that tradition. It's yeah, that culture yeah. that brings everyone together. That's right. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, I hate Ohio state, by the way. I just want to throw that That's out right. there. I needed to get it out. I'm not a big you, fan. How do you do? We're used to it. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, Hey, it's, it's jealousy. Hate. Yeah. It's jealousy. Let's be honest. That's all it we're, is. I'm just jealous that all of my teams are not very good. So shout out you guys for what you do, but I think that is so absolutely cool. And so, so we talk about that community aspect a little bit. What, what else have you learned? kind of through your travels, through sports, through this community, through team building, through networking, mm -hmm. how, what have you learned that allows you to go to this sweet, sweet mm -hmm. event in DC and then make that nice quick plane ride down to the beautiful yeah. <laughs> Miami beaches? What, what did you learn in sport that allows you to take forward into business and, and utilize mm -hmm. this really in just an everyday life? Well, when you play a sport and you go to practice every day and it sucks a lot of the time, because you're working your way from physically and mentally to a place that you want to be. And it's really, really hard. And you fail 90% of the time you fall, you get injured mentally, you're exhausted. You want to just hang out with your friends. Jesus, you know, we're 18 years old. Can I just go to my friend's house? No, you can't actually. And it teaches, it taught me. And I think it teaches a lot of athletes, especially when they take it to the collegiate level, this level of grit where failure is kind of expected. We almost want to fail because we know it gets us closer to the win or to whatever we're trying to accomplish. And so how that comes into business and especially entrepreneurship and startup life is startup life. You get your teeth kicked in pretty much every single day, every minute of every day. And I was with another founder in New York a couple of weeks ago, founder of mogul. And we're like, if there's one minute a month that we win, we're good. Hell yeah. And that's, we learned that from playing sports, you know, we, we practice hours and hours and hours after we go to lifting and we're doing, we're studying in off times because we're supposed to be at practices and we travel for games and we have appearances and that's a lot of work. It's really hard and you don't always want to do those things. Um, and so we learn to do things we don't always want to do and we overcome the failures because that gets us so much closer to that sweet, sweet win that maybe only lasts for two minutes, but damn, it's worth it. But it feels so darn oh, it's so good, good. Right? Yeah. I love it. And I think I uh, I want to say it's Marvin Harrison. So please don't quote me. Um, obviously, Marvin oh, Harrison. Oh, you hate Jr. us Show. so much. You know, no, 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 no. This is yeah, I know, right? Uh, you have <laughs> keep your keep your enemies close. I think is the uh, yeah, is, yeah. is the saying. No, I think it's it's Marvin Harrison said it. Um, you know, AI has his whole like we talking about practice, right? Like that that's always a fun one. But I think Marvin Harrison said you pay me to practice. Like the games are the fun part. The games are the parts I want to do. Like that's, that's mm -hmm. the part I will do for free for the rest of my life. It's the yeah. practice that I need to get paid for. Right. And that totally makes yeah. sense when you kind of think about it because practice sucks. Like it's not like it fun. It's fun when you get to that goal. Right. And, and seeing yeah. yourself improve and seeing the, the fruits of your labor. Right. Yeah. But like when you're in it, it stinks. Like there's nothing fun about practice. No, it sucks. And when you think about building a business, you know, day after day, you know, something goes wrong almost every single day and we're constantly solving for problems or going back to something that we need to iterate, talk to somebody else. We missed this or, you know, yeah, today, actually, our, our PR firm was like, did you know when you Google your company, it doesn't say what you do and it just says some like random disclosure. And we're like, OK, hmm. yeah, I guess. Shout not. out. <laughs> Thanks, PR company. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, it's like that seem that's seemingly small, but that's just constant all day. And that's practice. I mean, it's just brutal and you fall. And I remember in cheerleading, we when we stunt and stunting is when the guy, a guy holds up a girl. Um, there's two people now that are accountable for safety and and making whatever the skill is work. 
oh, we'd fall, these poor guys, I mean, we'd fall on their face, their nose, their shoulders are all busted up. Our backs would be, you know, falling over their head and it hurts. It's hard in football, you know, you're getting busted up every day by people. And it's not only physical, it's really, really mental too, because all you want to do really highly competitive people know that we need to accomplish these, these skills. So when we go have fun in, on, on the mat or in the arena or on the court, um, it has to be really good. We have to be near perfection to continue to win. And it's just, it's very exhausting, but it's just so worth it. Worth it. And, and so what's, how is it, especially in business and entrepreneurship, as you've been saying, like there's these little things that are going on constantly. It's got to fix this, got to fix that, got to fix this. What is it like, are you starting to get to the point where it's like, you're starting to see at least like, okay, it's a little easier today. You're still getting your teeth kicked in, but either you're more used to it. You, you got some calluses, right? Like you're you're yeah. capable of really kind of just, okay, tackle this, move on. What's the next thing? And yeah. to the point where it's starting to almost that momentum is starting to get going. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, because we learned it at such a young age, the, the momentum, the calluses, we've already had those coming into it. So we kind of already expected that we're going to make mistakes. We're not going to always get it right. But one, one of our rules in the company is, we are, we'll not always get it right, but we'll always do the right thing. So we already knew that, but from a momentum, my partner, I love her. Thank goodness we have each other because I will forget sometimes we're just, I'm just moving on to the next thing. And she's like, Tina, we just closed that investor. And I'm like, oh yeah, I guess we should have a drink. I don't know. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and you just forget to, because you're just on to the next thing. I think that is the difference between being a, in sport and being in business is the sport allows, I mean, they're, they're set up to celebrate wins. I mean, people are around you celebrating with you and you're kind of forced to, to do it in that moment. In business, you're kind of in control of everything and you forget to celebrate. I, I'll tell you, I shouldn't say everybody. I sometimes forget to celebrate the wins because we're so focused on blocking and tackling. Block, tackle, next thing, block, tackle until you get, and you, you know, you almost feel like you're never really going to win this. It's not a a game to win. It's just the process of solving problems and blocking and tackling is, is so energizing. So I forget to celebrate the wins. My partner is way better at that and bless her because she forces me to do it. So I like that you use the word energized too, because the, my follow-up was going to be, don't you get run down? Like yeah. you gotta oh, get yeah. burnt out yes. by that. But like yes. the, the, the small successes along the way sound like it's like, all right, cool. Now we're good. Little boosts. All right. It's two. Who needs a two o'clock coffee when I just fixed our Google yeah. SEO problems? Let's yeah. go. This is great. Right. Like how, like, yeah. how do you, how do you deal? Like, it sounds like your partner is there to help, which is awesome. Shout out her. Um, like how totally. do you deal with kind of the rundown? It's, it's exhausting. And we're on the investment trail too. We're raising capital and that is very much a numbers game, which is also kind of exciting because as a competitor, you know, it's reps and reps and reps, more shots on goal. So there's an element that brings out that competitiveness and that athlete in me, but it is very exhausting just meeting after meeting and going, going to different places, talking to the right people that understand the business that, that are good, going to be good partners for you. Um, and there, I don't know that I have a great answer for you. I mean, you just do it. And the days when you win, you kind of like that just makes up for the any exhaustion or frustration that comes with it. Um, you just do it. And I stopped when I would go to like pitch competitions or I'd go into an investment meeting or if I'd have to present. I When I was younger, immaturely, I would think I have to win this thing. I have to win this meeting. I have to win this podcast with Mike. And that was wrong. I, I didn't even... You, what I need to, what we, we morphed into as we got older and transitioned into business is I don't need to win this thing. I need to own it. And because sometimes you can't always control the result or the outcome. And so once we channeled that competitive mindset of owning whatever we're about to do and doing everything in our power to prepare, be ready, know who we're talking to, know any questions that are going to get asked, know the audience, we started to win a lot more and get those successes, which then you get less tired because you're prepared and you're not overthinking, oh, shoot, if I did that, that is more exhausting, the regret. And preparing up front is tiring practice, but the regret later is more mentally exhausting. So I've had to, I've changed that quite a bit over my career um, over the last 10 years or so. That's awesome. I don't know if you have said that before, but write that down, do something with that. Regret is more exhausting. Just just write that down. Put this that somewhere because right? that's an awesome quote. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I, I'm recording this. That's a really good point. Well, I'll clip that. How's that sound? Perfect. I'll clip it and send it over and you can just put that anywhere you'd like because that, that was really good. That was Thank really good. You. Um, so we're, we keep talking about doing all this stuff, but we're not talking about what we're doing it for. So let's get into the uh, business of what you're doing, right? I think I, that might I'm so excited help about bit. this. <laughs> Let's go. Perfect. Yeah, I had to I had to get you in and warm you up a little bit. So you are the co-founder and CEO of Five Star Fans. Mm -hmm. I'll let you explain it. I read up on okay. it. Bailey sent me over all the stuff, which is great. It looks pretty interesting. We got some NIL going. Let's talk yeah. about it. How are we helping yeah. these kids? Yeah. So we when we built the product um, and we, we started to brainstorm around what we wanted to do, Jennifer, my partner and I, um, it was about it was summer of 2022, so a year after NIL came out in July, 2021. And so we summer in 22 and we were like, we love it. We were always so we were excited about it. But then as it became more of a hot topic, we're highly, we're still highly engaged in athletics on several boards at Ohio state and volunteer and whatever. We were like, we, we need to do something. We love sports. We love athletics. We're in a fortunate place in our careers where we can leave those and do something. We found some data out around the college sports fan. It just was pushed out like three years ago. And we shouldn't be surprised, but we kind of were. It quoted college sports fan as the largest and the most affluent fan base in the United States, period, out of any other sport and fan base. And like, we're hearing that, you're like, yeah, yeah okay, that makes sense. But at the time, God, we didn't even realize how powerful this group of people are. And then her and I look at each other and we start laughing because we're like, I mean, we literally performed and grew up and were trained to engage fans. Like we're the best at it. And, and we also joke too, like we'd be on the side you're talking about, you know, a hundred thousand people in a stadium cheering, pouring their sleep. We could feel the breath of them from the side. You know, we could literally, feel and taste the passion and energy and emotions of these people. And so we knew we need to build something for them. There's a lot of disconnect in the everyday college sports fan, unless you're a donor or a booster, they don't have really great ways to get a deeper connection to the university and directly impact athletes. And then we started to find from, I met um, who ended up being our first investor, a guy at a tech event in Columbus. And I talked to him a little bit about what we were doing. And we started to learn together that, when athletes are in high school, there's a ton of media and recruiter attention and everybody's focused on where are these kids visiting? How many times do they visit? Did their parents go with them? Where are their offers? What are the schools saying about them? What's their performance? Millions and mil tens of millions of dollars are being made by talking about high school athletes and where they're going to go play. And we were like, well, why don't we let the fans get involved in that? So we built five-star fans to allow college sports on their recruiting journey financially. That's awesome. Thanks. That's so awesome. Yeah. That, I mean, I am one of the people that listens to those college football recruiting podcasts. Like, yeah. I love and them. It's cool. I love it's them so much. Yeah. Have you signed up? That's on so cool. What? Not yet. Oh, well, not okay. too many people are going to, really uh, not, not, not too many, not too many people are going to Rutgers. So, uh, I don't, I don't know how much, how much I can help there. So, that's true. I think Shiano actually has a solid, uh, a solid base this year. I don't think we're going to compete against Ohio State, but I will say uh, my buddy who I was telling you about that lives over in, in Cleveland, we make the uh -huh. same bet every year, um, and it's Rutgers to cover the spread. Um, we've won a couple times. I'll just say that. We, we, we okay. cover the 39 points, so that, you know, it's not that bad. We'll take yeah, it. Yeah. But no, yeah. I think that is such a cool, cool concept. And as you said, like, I love the research and everything that went behind it, right? Like the fact that, hey, we want to get fans more engaged. Hey, we're realizing how much people, how much money there is in just high school, just talking about high school recruiting, right? Mm -hmm. Not even like the actual dollars that go into um, the now NIL collectives and all these things, right? We see some wild numbers going out. Shout out the athletes. I think they deserve every single penny. Um, yeah. What, how, I guess like this isn't the first iteration, right? Like what, how did, how did we get here? Cause this seems like it was, there was a lot of thought, a lot of, maybe not rights and wrongs, but a lot of experimenting that got mm -hmm. to this point. What was like that first spark of, Hey, like we need to get into this. Okay. Maybe we should do this. Wait, wait, wait. no, maybe we should do this. Let, let's build on like, what was that first thing that got us to this point? The core, the fundamental core of the product where fans can give likes to players and players make money that has not changed, but 
what's been iterated in on is the product, how we have flow of currency throughout, how we do our marketing, how we engage with the athletes. What do the athletes care about? What do their parents care about? That's you, you asked me earlier, we might talk about differentiator or why we're going to win. Um, so I'm going to spill our secret sauce out, but we build relationships with the parents and the coaches too. These kids are 14, 15 years old, and they're the people that they're trusting and looking up to for decision making and mentorship. We need them to know we are going to take care of their kids too. So it's important for us to understand what the parents care about, the coaches and the athlete. So we have quite a few stakeholders and that's what we iterated on over the past nine months is we started to learn that it's not just fan and athlete. There are so many other people that are part of the system. And, you know, we find, especially with NIL right now, it's, it's a hot topic. It's a, it's a disruptive industry, which is the perfect time to add economic layer and add different type of value. And there's a ton of money to be had. But what we find is there's a lot of people that only are in it to make a buck because they see they can find a crack in a system and drive a wedge and make some money. We are not going to do that. We know we have a lot of work to do where people need to trust us. They, they need to know we're going to do it right. And we have to prove that. And so from an iteration perspective, it was who do we build relationships with? Um, how do we make sure they know we're doing it right? What do we have to show them to get that trust early on? Because we're a new company too, and it's a new industry. So, and then from a marketing perspective, what do the, how are the fans going to feel valued and engaged constantly throughout the products? Because it's not just, I give my five bucks to Mike and hope he goes to Rutgers. They need more to do. The fans want to feel connected. And we say, we want fans not to have that. We, you know, when you said there's 105,000 people at Ohio Stadium, um, that's once a week they get that feel. We want people to feel that energy and capture how we do that better. That's brilliant. So two things. One, I want to point out, um, understanding the coaches, I think, is very, very smart, right? You want to make sure that they understand and they trust what's going on because, hey, this is helpful to them, right? It's not like yeah, this is yeah. very helpful to them. We're, they're always asking fans for money, right? I think Michigan has that. I'm sorry, that team up north, they have that. that um, Thank you like, for the correction. Yeah, I got you. I got you. I got you. I, <laughs> I cross out all my M's that week. Don't worry. I hate both yeah. teams, so it's cool. It's just a fun <laughs> game. I, I hate, it's, I'm so frustrated. I hate both those teams, and that's one of my favorite games all year. So I'll just – I'm sorry. But um, no, so like Michigan has that collective where it's specifically like they just ask fans to donate money so that they can give money to Blake Corum so he can save for another year, right? So it's like a really interesting way of going about it where you guys are pretty much just facilitating that entire process. Um, yeah. Another thing you said, you know, get get involved with the parents, right? I think mm -hmm. Nick Saban would always talk about like sitting down at mom's kitchen table and eating her gumbo, whether she was good at it or not, he would eat it and he would say it was the best, right? So it's really engaging with the family too, I think is important. And then understanding, I guess, how are you, you know, you said all these things, you, you want to engage the fans, you want them to feel that feeling of being in that stadium at all times. I guess, what are you guys doing to allow them to feel that mm -hmm. engagement when they do come to your app every day? Yeah, we, um, so we started, we'll start to layer in gamification, which is probably going to get us to the FSGA conversation and gaming. And I know that you're, you're affiliated with ESPN and bet and stuff like that. So we can talk about it, but we know we want to gamify it because that's a huge industry and people are highly engaged. There are pretty large trajections around gamification and mobile gaming where people want to decompress and they'll go to candy crush for 20 minutes or Roblox or Minecraft or whatever is on your phone, Wordle, or I don't even, I don't play games on my phone. Me neither, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but we know people do it. And so we want to offer them different ways like that where they can come to us and decompress. Oh, by the way, and you're still helping your university and your athletes. So the, the my favorite thing, they're not rolled out yet, but we have these free to play games and they look like old Nintendo games. So they're a pixelated like duck hunt, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's just like, I teared up when I first saw them mocked up because it's awesome. They're like, there's three of them. Each of them are about 30 to 45 seconds a piece. And so you'll play like little, these free to play games that are sport related. And then you can continue to earn currency in the product by doing stuff like that. And then badges and reward systems where fans will start to earn, you know, when you close your rings on your Apple watch or you earn badges when you order enough guacamole at Chipotle or something like that. And all of those start to add up and you can cash those in for, you know, coupons at Conrad's, which is a bookstore that has a lot of merchandise or fanatics or whoever our partners are at the time um, that are affiliated with that particular university. 
you can use those for discounts on merchandise and jerseys. Right. And then you can even, and you've already thought of this, I'm sure, but like you, you, especially in those very localized markets that you're familiar with, but then eventually like all, all those localized markets, right? So you have the person who's playing that game, they get that coupon to Conrad's because Conrad's is actually donating to the local collective and they're trying to get the athletes to come here. So now yeah. you're support, supporting their business by proxy as well as getting new people to support their business, right? In multiple ways, because they are all tied to trying to bring, we are all tied to try and bring the best athletes to Columbus here, right? So it's like that that's whole right. mindset of just keep completing that ecosystem, because that's one of the coolest parts about a college town, right? Everyone knows the local bar. Everyone yeah. goes to the same pizza place. Everyone goes to stuff your face at Rutgers, right? Like there's just a few of those places that I will never forget their names because I went yeah. there so many damn times, right? Yeah. And everyone- and it's, you know, it's, it's always, you know, my dad's dad's dad, right? He used to go to this bar. This was his seat, right? Like, so it's that aspect of it. And if you can get those businesses involved, that is what just intensifies that community more, mm -hmm. right? Because that business is trying to get the best players to come to Ohio State because mm -hmm. the better players come to Ohio State, the more students come here, the more students come here, the more money everybody makes. Thank so you it's for just like an easy, easy ecosystem. That's right. And thank you for saying it like that, because sometimes we forget that when well, people get very psychologically validated, even if they've been out of their university for 20, 30 years, if a star player chooses or somebody chooses your alma mater, you are psychologically validated. And that's important for people to feel that connection constantly. And actually, and it actually gets even deeper with time. And so the businesses around, so people go to college, even if they're not athletes, based on sometimes they'll make decisions based on how good some of the sports teams are. And that's reality. And I don't, we don't talk about that enough, but when, when we talk, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, well, the athletic programs already have enough money. They're rich, they're, they're swimming in money. Well, okay, not really, because they have to spend nearly all of it. And by the way, the better the team is, the better the student body is going to be coming in. So that actually, that nucleus needs to become- 100%, 100%. I can't remember the statistic. I'm sure we could do a quick Google search, but I'll just throw some random numbers out there, right? It's like after a team wins a national championship in football or basketball, like admissions go up by, I don't know, X percent, call it 10, 15, 20%, yeah. whatever number you want to use, only because that team just won, you know, UConn won back-to-back -back national championships. Mm -hmm. So their admissions are going to go up. What does that mean? Supply slash demand, right? The That's right. demand is higher. The supply- is the same guess what it costs a couple extra bucks to get in there and that is all due to the athletic department right mm -hmm. that is all due to that team your favorite team the team that you scream about the most on saturdays or sundays or whatever day of the week it is because they won you're you're so excited to send your kids there or your kids are like you know what mom i am gonna go to ohio state let's do and that's yeah. a bad example of course your kids are gonna go to ohio state but yeah. you know it's that <laughs> exactly see um but no it's that kind of thing that just allows that ecosystem to live mm -hmm. even further and even truer um yeah. what are some of the successes we'll, we'll get to the fsga because obviously yeah okay. I, I'm, I'm in the betting space so i definitely I do want to get there um okay. more about five star though what like what are some of the successes that you guys have seen so far uh, on the mm -hmm. investor front, on the athlete mm -hmm. front, on the fan front, on the local business front, anything really that you can start to point to and be like, yo, this is going to be awesome. We just need a couple more dollars and we're going to yeah. blow this thing up. Yeah. Thanks for saying that. And I don't have to say it. Gotcha. <laughs> um, yeah. We've, well, thanks to Jennifer. Like I said, she reminds us of the wins. But when we talk about some of the things that we've seen successful already, even if they're in small, you know, the, the, scale is small we know if we can put more money into it that expands it pretty greatly an early success we had um early on was there was an athlete number one recruit in the country he was committing 10 days from the time we spoke with him and we were able to sign him up on the product and it's kj bolden he signed up and he saw a ton of activity already knowing he was going to commit in less than 10 days from the day that we that he got his profile on our on five star fans um, that was a really early win and that kind of jaded us a little bit because not everybody's going to have that type of energy. So we had to learn how else do we get athletes good traction. And we also, so then we started to find that when athletes are really authentic and they see the value themselves and post it on their Instagram or Twitter, um, those athletes get really fast traction by really authentic videos that they make about and, and took them eight seconds to do. And so those were some good wins that we started to realize. 
And now we can start to pump more dollars and energy into how do we get more athletes engaged to promote themselves so they realize and see the value that they're going to be making over the next couple of years in recruiting. From an investor perspective, we got um, one of the big wins was we are one of our first and early investors. He, his partners were the attorneys on the 2014 Ed O'Bannon case. I don't know if you remember or even know about this. It was one of the early cases around athletes monetizing in some way. And it was one of the big ones that went to the Supreme Court. It was really public. It's called the Ed O'Bannon case. And he, so he has been obsessed with this type of activity in college athletics for nearly a decade. And so having him in our corner who's understood it and watched it for such a long time was a big success for us. And then some of the advisors we got on our team too, you know, you were asking earlier, how do you manage being tired or like keep the energy? It's if you don't have a good team, it's just, you're not going to make it. And we have just the best. Our lawyer is from blank Rome. Um, and he sits on every major college athletic NIL panel conference across the country. I mean, just brilliant. That's a huge win for us. Anthony Schlegel was a linebacker at Ohio State, um, entrepreneur himself, really smart businessman, great family guy, successful in, in football, um, college and NFL. He's on our advisory board. So like those are really solid wins that we got people to support us early on. And those have been successes. And then um, what did you ask about? You said athlete. Oh, from a fan perspective, we've had people be brutally honest with us, which is perfect. That's awesome. It's not yeah, always thankfully. Nice. And some of it sucks because we're like, damn, that we didn't want it to suck that bad for you. But they've been very honest with us. And sending out a survey has does it just doesn't work. We have to talk to them one on one. We have to watch. I mean, we would sit there and watch them on their phone and we'd watch them bump through the product and they would say, I hate this. And we were like, thank you. So why those do are, you hate this? At least this yeah. is a why that would be helpful. But. No, you know, that that's another element of building something is. They don't know. They know they don't like it, but they don't know why. And they don't have to know why. That's our job. Our job is to figure out a better way. A customer doesn't have to have the solution for you. Their job is to just let you know whether they're going to find value or not. And so um, we've had it. We've and then, oh, lastly, from a product perspective, big win. Um, our CTO, we hired him in November. Um, he came from Netflix. This dude is a monster. I mean, he's so stinking brilliant and he's been around tech startups for two decades. So he really could tell me what to do. So I think it's the team, which is the biggest win for us. Um, they're just, it's pretty special. That's awesome. No, I love that. And I think that's so, uh, it's so refreshing to hear, right? A CEO actually listening uh, to people in the business. I well, think that's pretty necessary. They don't listen. Okay. You hear them <laughs> though. I eventually yeah. do what they tell me to do. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think that's great. <laughs> and I, I think from, from the fan perspective, right? Like I think college football, like I, I, I keep going back to college football because it's the easiest, mm -hmm. right? Obviously yeah. any athlete yeah. I'm sure could be, could be involved in this with, I don't, I don't know how, um, it sounds like your mental health is in a good spot. So maybe don't go doing, you know, jumping on all these message boards, but like, that's the place you got to get this out on. Right. You exactly. gotta, you know, you gotta gain some steam on Reddit or whatever the hell it's called. And then you just got to drop and be like, Hey, like, I really want this guy to go to Ohio state. Maybe you guys should give a couple dollars, right? Maybe you just give a couple bucks for him to come to Ohio state. It might help. Yeah. Right. Oh, and, and here's a sweet app that'll let you do it right like yeah. those people are crazy and that's one of the reasons why i love college football so much is because yeah. of the passion sometimes it is borderline psychotic and sometimes it's like way past that borderline and they're just straight up psychotic but i just mm -hmm. love every second of it as long as everyone you stays use safe the word rabid sometimes rabid that's a no. i don't know if that's a good word actually i mean it's a great word to use as description but i don't think anyone wants to be described as rabid probably right? not yeah, yeah. <laughs> um i guess one other thing that that's interesting like uh, chicken or the egg um is right. it you needed a bunch of athletes to be like hey we're on this platform did you need a bunch of people to be like hey we want to use this platform we need to find like hey reach out to athlete get on this platform so i can throw you some dollars like how how did you guys kind of do the, the the chicken and the egg with the athletes and the fans that is a good question thank and you I don't know that we got it right, right away. Yeah. We started with um, a handful of athletes. We knew we want, of course, you know, in beta, you just want to start small, test it, make sure it's good for them. And so we started with seven athletes, very manual. I mean, we talked to them several times, talked to their parents, watched them sign up. Um, and then we just, we didn't do any marketing 
initiative. We didn't pay for marketing. We just kind of let it, we sent it to some friends and see what would happen so we could get feedback really fast. And um, from a chicken and an egg perspective, we learned that even a small user base can be highly, highly engaged and they can keep transacting on the product Regardless, if you have a huge number of users, if you have a small number of users that are highly engaged, that's more valuable than having a million people that have only visited you one time. So our mistake in the beginning, we thought we had to have a bazillion users right away for us to look at and for the athletes to think, am I going to even get value out of this? So we learned fairly quickly that we need to give the fans, so we, we relate it to an amusement park. If you go to an amusement park and there's one ride, okay, I'm going to ride the ride and then I leave. Why would I come back and ride the same ride? I may, I may because it was kind of fun. I like that roller coaster. But we learned we needed to offer the fans more rides in the amusement park. And so rather than trying to completely get crazy and getting tons of fans right away that we weren't sure we're going to stick, stick around, we started to offer our current engaged fan base more of what they wanted. So we built more rides. So what we did was we um, got more athletes on the product. They wanted to look and browse and see more. And, you know, even if you're a Rutgers fan, Michigan State fan, Georgia fan, people started to want to just look at what Ohio State has. And I'm, a, I'm an Ohio State fan. I kind of want to see what recruits are at Michigan because people are like the voyeurism part of it, too. Um, and so we learned we had to flip our, our mindset from the chickies of athletes for fans to look at. That so, um the that's awesome. Athletes came first. Yeah. That, that, it makes sense that you, again, you, you learned, right. You tried yeah. something. It didn't quite still work. Learned, so yeah. we tried it. Yeah. Still learning, of course, but you were able to then figure that out. And then, so I guess how, so you said you started with that small group of athletes. How do mm -hmm. you, how did you expand that number of athletes? Was it, Hey, mm -hmm. tell your friends, Hey, here's a referral huh? code Tell all your like, or were you guys just reaching out again to coaches, to parents, to anybody that, that would listen and say, Hey, just sign up, start. Do you, do you, do athletes post anything within the app themselves? I see, like, Not picture. yet. No, I, it's I coming. I can though. talk about that. Yeah, okay, they cool. have photos, but um, we we are just with the relationships because we've been around college athletics for twenty years. We know people that are around college athletics, and so when you asked earlier why are you guys going to win, that's one of the reasons why we're going to win. We've been around it for a long time. We know the system. We know people, and at collegiate sports and athletics is a community where you just get a badge of honor and credibility. As soon as you say, Oh, I was a, I was a college athlete too. Boom. We're friends. I trust you. I'm going to help you. And so that's what happened when we started to try to, we needed to get athletes to understand who we were and sign up. So we partnered up with some folks that we had connections with that served as advisors and agents of athletes. And then they would tell their clients and the parents that they were working with, and then we brought a guy onto our advisory board, which is another huge win for us. He's like the master of recruiting in the Midwest. His name is Jeremy Birmingham. He is just a wizard and he, people trust him dearly. So he helped us get in touch with some recruits early on that would come on early to the product. And then we started to notice that other athletes would see their peers do it and they'd want to come on and create a profile. Companies that in the college sports world, specials for the athletes. And then the athlete just claims it through a verification. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Make it even easier for him. It's like, Hey, yeah, yeah that's me. Okay, cool. If yeah. I just click this button, I just get money potentially. Cool. Hey, yeah. yeah. Well, what, what's the problem there? That's awesome. Yeah, right. um, and then to the, to the point of, so you, you, I guess how, like how many athletes are you guys creating these profiles for? Like what, what numbers are we up to? The, there's public data. And so we leverage machine learning and, you know, the hot buzzword is AI. I was going to say, why did you not say AI? But yeah, no, I don't makes know. Sense. I'm trying to be cool and not say it, but I'm not cool. So we use AI. Our, our dev team uses that to scrape from the public records. And most, most sites have the top 250 football players from each class and then the top 100 basketball from each class, recruiting class. And so that's who we automatically upload for initially whatever's public, then we leverage the AI to create the profile and then um, they come and claim it. Now, if you recruit 251 for the class of 2025, you can still create your own profile. We just don't have enough information to do it for them because it hasn't been published. But um, we just had someone I met um, a few weeks ago, I ran into a recruit and he created his own profile. It was helpful because he had a lot of feedback and we had to change that a little bit. But um, 
Yeah. So that's how we do. We try to make it easy for the athlete because our belief system is any more than they all make it simple for them. Um, and so if a profile is created, can a user start to give likes to this profile, even if they're so, so people can just start racking up dollars, not even yep. know that you guys exist and you guys yeah. can go to them and say, Hey, I actually have all this money for you. Would you like yep. it? That's a yeah. pretty, that's a pretty easy sale at that point. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And Jennifer, my partner, she does a real, a lot of my focus is on the road, more of the, like external investment, strategic meetings. She does a beautiful job of going to events and places where pay out and then it, it becomes a lot easier. That's awesome. And so with the, and I, I'm, I apologize that we're going, we're going a little late. I hope you're not like super busy. Um, no. With the advent, let's call it, of the the new transfer portal, right? You used to be able to, tra I think people forgot you used to actually be able to transfer in college sports. It was just like really, really hard and yeah. ridiculous process. Now it's just, hey, every spring, summer, fall, you want to go, more power to you, man. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, with that, like, and, and again, that the Michigan piece that I was talking about before, like with, are you, are you creating profiles for current athletes? Because it seems yeah. like every single day, like, hey, you know, I can enter the transfer portal. Doesn't mean I'll stay or go. It just means I'm going to be on the lookout for what's out there. Like, yep. are dollars coming my way? Maybe they are. Maybe they aren't. Yep. Yeah. That. So, transfer portal and current rosters are two separate things. So, I'll break it up. Um, transfer portal. I I agree with you. It used to be you'd have to sit out a year, have a red shirt year. I didn't always agree with that type of level. I I don't know if it's the word punishment or that rule because if people coaches could change Coach, jobs that was always, exactly that was always if a coach can leave why can't i and when you think about the labor jobs and don't have these repercussions sometimes it's the right thing for the future of that person that athlete now moving and getting a three million dollar check and then transferring again you know that's a whole different story we'll we'll right. we'll figure that part out but yeah. well you know okay you want to know my opinion on this breaking yep. news this is the first time i'm sharing it okay so you know when people are in corporate and maybe they relocate you to Ohio, from Jersey to Ohio, you want to move to Avon Lake by your friends mm. and they give you a relocation package, 30 grand. And then you quit in six months. You have to pay that 30 grand back. Well, just do that with the transfer portal. If you get $3 million from a collective to move from USC to Georgia, and then you leave Georgia before the season even starts, you're paying that $3 million back. Okay. Or at least a percentage of it. I mean, that's not unreasonable and it's not something new in revelation. It's just, it happens and that's fair. I mean, if you're treating this like a job to try to make money, then there's gotta be similar parallels to that. So anyways, I love that. On it. So love yes, it. to transfer portal, but you brought up current roster. So we started to learn recently as we've talked to other coaches, you know, Miami lost eight of their players to the transfer portal and they have like three left. Um, and, and that's, there's a lot of, that going on across with other coaches. We learned from that stakeholder, the, the college coach very quickly. They said, love the recruiting. We need that. But right now retention is just such a big deal. And so we needed to satisfy that pain point. And um, so we piloted, we did it first with Ohio State. We opened up the entire spring roster a couple of weeks ago during the spring game to allow Ohio State fans to start sending currency to current players to start to prove out that retention model. And so we'll start to do that with our other university partners. We'll unlock the current rosters some kind of relate. Yeah. So recruiting, recruiting your roster um, is what they say a lot on these college football podcasts that talk about recruiting. It's recruiting high schools, yeah. recruiting the portal. And it's also, you're still in the process of making sure the guys you have on the team, which I guess is a good thing, right? You want to keep those people happy, but I, I think I agree with you. It's it's definitely way over the top. The pendulum, if you talk about swinging, it is way to the other side. I think right. when we find yeah. a nice middle ground, I think everyone it will, will actually calibrate. be. It will. Um, it will. But right now, you know what? The players were kind of, you know, put down for so long. Let them make a couple bucks, right? I'm sure you would have yeah. loved the opportunity, right? But we, yeah. you would never leave the school. But you got to you gotta play your cards, man. You got to say yeah. I might leave. Give me a couple bucks. I'll stay. Don't worry. I know. But yeah. um, no, I think that's awesome. And so my last question before we just hop into FSGA stuff for a couple seconds, okay. what, like, how easy is it for an athlete just to get this money? Like, is it's just, mm. hey, we got some likes and like, it. do I just withdraw it? Is it PayPal? Do you want my Venmo? Yeah. Do you need my social? Like, how, how, does that, how does that part work? Thank you for asking that. Yeah, it's really, really simple. So the quid pro quo still exists. Um, and another thing 
to us, the most critical piece is compliance. We never want to be the cause of an athlete being non-compliant or ineligible. And so we take the, the stance of even if you're in a state as a high schooler where you can have NIL, NIL exchange financially, um, you don't get your money dispersed until you enroll in your actual university. So once they enroll, the quid pro quo is a pretty simple social media post that they put on um, Instagram and Twitter. And then that satisfies that marketing transaction that they have to do. And then what we do is um, there are a lot of tools and do the, the monetary transfer that way. Super easy. And then I guess I should also ask, so say I give... Marvin Harrison, Junior Juniors, uh, a couple dollars to come to Rutgers. He was never going to come to Rutgers. Yeah. Do I just get my money back? You don't. Um, that's that's the gamification. So mm. when you play Candy Crush and you pay a dollar ninety nine to get you know ten more gems, you paid for to have a you're paying for that experience to enhance your experience. So you don't get your money back. However, what we do is we partner with the institutions. So this, again, there's another layer of stakeholders that we found in the system that need support to Rutgers. Well, we are going to actually reinvest a portion of that back to Rutgers athletics. That's awesome. Okay, cool. So I'm still doing good for Rutgers. That's great. Yeah, that's right. It didn't yep. quite get me where I wanted to, but like we knew Marvin Harrison Jr. Jr. was not going to come to Rutgers. Come on, that was but easy. Fun. So you're paying yeah. for that experience and even the hope or the possibility that's that's the engagement and that's the psychological connection that people are going to have. And when you sports bet, if you play, you know, if you're playing mobile games, you're still spending a couple dollars here and there. And we're not we're we're not targeting the donors and boosters writing ten thousand dollar checks. You know, this is your Starbucks money. If you can't afford to lose five dollars. OK, we yes. don't want to make you go broke because of us. That's... But generally speaking, if you spend a couple bucks here and there and you don't get it back, it, it it's generally OK. And now my last, 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 last question. How do you guys okay. make money? There we follow. So we do still keep a portion of the Rutgers money. We give some to the Rutgers, but we keep a portion of that. But our bread and butter really isn't from that. It's similar model to some social platforms where there's advertising and corporate partnerships. And then we, we aggregate data of fan behavior. So this is where we use AI again within the system is we leverage all the data analytics from certain fan bases and geographies, and we can package that up really nicely and say, hey, institution, do you want to learn more about your fan base? And so we can sell things like that. Um, we'll sell currency eventually, skins or change their profile color or have an avatar monetize the most. Nice. Very cool. That was awesome. Thanks so much, Tina. This was great. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, the FSGA piece. You said mm -hmm. working with the gamification in the app has led you kind of into this path. So t tell me a little bit about what you're doing with FSGA, Fantasy mm -hmm. Sports and Gaming Association, um, mm -hmm. what, you, what you're doing with them as a board member, but also how you're utilizing the connections, the relationships, the responsibilities for five-star fans as well. Yeah, in February, uh, the FSGA had their winter conference in Vegas, and I was able to be part of the pitch competition. There were 11 of us, I think, and I won. And I learned really fast when I was there within 10 seconds of me explaining what we do, people got it immediately. And I'm like, this is where I need to stay. I need to be in this space because we're not sports betting. We're not gambling. We're not fantasy, but those parallels psychologically of how fans interact and the emotion that they put into sports, a lot of similarities, a lot of parallels. And so those folks, the investors, the partners, the operators, the people, the mentors, they all get what we do really well. So we needed to stick around them and learn from them. And so then shortly after that, um, one of my mentors said, would you be interested in being on the board? And I said, hell yeah. And so I got, I went for election. I got elected and I joined just, I think in April, uh, we started in April, this board. And part of, part of my responsibility there is bringing the college athletic mindset. They, they hadn't had that lens in a while because we really couldn't. And now with NIL and there's so many things changing, you know, we're on the cusp of seeing some things pretty great that are going to happen in the betting space. A big priority we're talking about right now is, is protecting athletes and prop bets and discussing what should that look like? Should that be legal? How do you do it? How do you protect the athlete? Um, so those are big conversations we're talking about now. And how do we get in front of it? So we can help with regulation, mentorship, having the right discussions and bringing people to these conferences to talk about it. Um, people are amazing. I mean, gosh, they're just so stinking brilliant. 
I'm, I'm lucky to be around them and I get to learn quite a bit. I almost, I'm like, are you sure you guys want me here? But it's been fun. They're super welcoming and how we leverage the relationships is very much from mess and they see the value. Awesome. Yeah. What a, what a great connection that you were able to make in your brain to say, wait, these people get this. Awesome. Let's talk to more people like this because yeah. people, <laughs> people beget people, right? Birds of a feather flock together. And it sounds like yeah. you know, kind of just immersing yourself in that community will only help you guys get bigger. It sounds like. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's Very right. grateful that we got to ask that too. Tina, this has been incredible. Where can we learn more about you? Where can we more learn more about five star? Where can we go to download it? And where can we go to sign up? Um, where can I go find Marvin Harrison Jr. Jr.? I guess that's my You question. can find him at 5-starfans.com. Um, it's not a, it's not the app store yet, so it's just a prog progressive web app. You can get it on your mobile device or your desktop. Um, you can sign up pretty quickly. Uh, I think in under 20 seconds now. I was quoted in another interview. I said, it takes like under a minute. He's like, yeah, it only took me 10 seconds. I'm like, even better. I'm Perfect. learning every day. <laughs> Three likes for spending time. Let's with go. Me. Yeah. Marvin Harrison Jr. Jr. He's yep, coming to Rutgers, Jr. baby. Let's do it. He's, he's going to be, I mean, he's got like what, like 18 to 20 years, depending on exactly what the timeline is. But I'm very confident that we're going to get him. I'm confident. Thank you, Tina. I like that One last time. Yeah. Tina, Tina, not Teeny. We did that in the beginning. Tina Provost, <laughs> former Division One cheerleader, co-founder, CEO, five-star fans, FSGA member uh, of the board of directors. Tina, time's the only thing we don't get more of. So I really appreciate you giving me more than I asked for. So I really do appreciate that. Of course. Thank you for Thank the people you for listening. Time's the only thing we don't get more of. So I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you all. And hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye, everybody.